So hi, uh, my name's Philip. I work for Honeycomb. Um, I'm on the product team. Uh, I, um, I'm talking about a fun topic, uh, how open telemetry helps generative AI. I'm not going to talk about open telemetry very much, though. Um, and that's because open telemetry is like one of the least interesting parts of all of this, which I think is kind of like a goal of the project, if you will. It just kind of works and is really helpful for people. Um, so that's what this is going to be about. Uh, this is based on uh, last year, uh, early last year. Um, I did the old uh, fuck around and find out thing, um, where in the course of around, I found out a whole lot about how you can make AI better when you uh, build a feature and then release it to all of your users uh, and um, find out what they actually want to do with it uh, once it's live. Um, and it turns out having good observability for things like, what are people putting into this input box? What does the output look like? What do we do about that? Um, it's kind of a, a, a good, good use for observability, so let's get into it. Um, so, AI is, all hype all the, bleh, AI is all the hype these days. Um, this talk is not going to be focused on infrastructural level stuff. So this is not about like monitoring your GPUs um, or anything like that. If you're like working in the cloud offering Gen AI services, you might care more about that. You might care more about how you do inference um, monitoring. All of those are like completely other talks that we could give. Uh, this is for the majority of people out there who are building applications that use some generative AI model like GPT-4 um, behind an API. And they want to just make it good. Because what's really cool is like, we've kind of gotten to this world where like quite literally the world's most powerful machine learning models are broadly available for anyone to use at a relatively cheap price and getting a lot faster and a lot cheaper by the like month, basically. Um, so like this bottleneck where like you could maybe build something really cool using AI um, was like stuck in the likes of Amazon and Google and Meta and Microsoft and all that. Like, you just couldn't do that as a normal developer. Now that's not the case anymore. But that doesn't mean that, like, everything is all magic and sugar and all of that. Um, there's, there's a lot of problems that people have um, when it comes to managing costs, when it comes to understanding how these models even perform, when it comes to figuring out what the right kind of application you're going to build is. Um, there's like killer apps already with like ChatGPT and GitHub Copilot, but like chances are if you're gonna ch create like a chat wrapper, it's not gonna do very well. If you're gonna try to create like a little code completion thing, um, good luck competing against GitHub. Uh, they've got like a five year head start on you. So, um, you know, it's great, but like there's a lot of opportunities out there that are just outside of chat apps and outside of little tab completion code helpers. Um, but I think like it's safe to say that this sort of broke the tech world. Uh, and it's still a little bit broken, and we're probably due for one of those like Gartner hype cycle troughs of disillusionment pretty soon. Um, but like the the, the it, like it's fundamentally changed now. Like we have fundamental computing capabilities that we just didn't have anymore. Um, so, what does that mean? Well, they are powerful but inscrutable black boxes. Um, it is by design that language models, that generative AI uh, in general, is either non-deterministic by design, or even if you turn down the temperature config, which is a value that you can, that you can use, um, down to zero, uh, depending on the model you're using, it's still non-deterministic. And like, there's a lot of variance there where some smaller models actually are deterministic and all of that. But like, the point is, if you want to generate so-called creative responses to things based off of inputs that come in, you don't want something that produces boring outputs, usually. Like that, you just don't use AI if that's the case. Like you want something that produces really interesting outputs that are interesting, but like now your users kind of do expect some degree of reliability, and you have an inscrutable black box that like you try to prompt it, and like good luck trying to understand what the best prompting technique is. There's like 20 or 30 of them that are probably helpful, and some are going to regress certain things and make other things better, and like you're not going to know up front which one is the right one. Um, you're going to have totally different behavior in production compared to development because your users are going to do things you could never possibly expect. And you're going to have to learn the hard way that like, you got to do something different. You can't just like write some unit tests and hope it gets better. So that's not going to happen. If you just try to say, well, it looks good on my machine. Let's throw it in production. Like, it's going gonna, it's gonna to produce garbage. It's not going to be any good. And you're not going to be able to keep that feature in production. So. Um, let's start a diagram for a little bit. This is basically every Gen AI app today. Uh, it's massively oversimplified, of course. Um, but outside of like the super boring, useless chat apps that people write um, when they're not named OpenAI, um, 
there's some form of input, generally producing some kind of output, it's almost always some kind of JSON. And the things that happen in between are really interesting. There's one or more language model calls. It's usually only one, because that's usually all that you need. But there's this whole stack of stuff beforehand um, called search service. Uh, I pulled this, this diagram out there where it talks about vector search. Uh, a lot of the AI world is sort of relearning that vector search is not the only kind of search that you can do that's really helpful. The goal is that you want to take user input gather a whole bunch of contextual information about like what could be helpful to produce an answer to the question that they have or the output that you're trying to achieve and gather as much of that as possible and produce um, uh, a, a context package, if you will. It's, uh, it's called Retrieval Augmented Generation, or RAG. It was this really cool behavior that some meta researchers found in 2020 where they figured out that language models, if they are not trained on a certain kind of data, but you feed in that data on a request to it, they can kind of act like they were trained on that data. And there's a little bit of wiggle room there, but like it's really cool because you don't need to train your own language model. You can use an off-the-shelf language model and pass in a whole bunch of stuff and produce useful things. And so this is what almost everybody who is building AI apps today is building some form of this diagram, okay? So there's really two key questions that you need to answer when you're building this stuff and you wanna make it better. Um, notice I don't have the words latency, error rate, CPU statistic, GPU, blah, 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 whatever. Uh, it's, is the data right, like is the right data being fed to the model in the first place? Like if I'm gathering context for somebody's user input, am I actually gathering the right context? Uh, I talked to someone last year who has a version of that diagram where that search service is actually six different databases. And one of the questions they have is, okay, based off of the user's input, are we calling the right database or not? Um, how many should we call? How do we merge those results together? What sorts of search um, systems do we, do we actually have? And like, can I systematically show that on like classes of inputs, I can produce context packages, if you will, that are actually right for that kind of input? How do I like measure that and see if it's continuing to improve over time and like not regressing over time? Similarly, on the model side, how do you know that it's behaving correctly when you actually do have the right inputs, right? So like, assume that you have retrieval, which is a really hard problem in a lot of cases solved, is it actually still doing the right thing? Like, are you using the right prompting techniques? Do, are you at a point where you need to actually fine tune a language model? Are you at a point where, God help you, you have to train your own language model? I certainly hope that's not the case. And similarly, can you systematically show that you're making progress? When you go to production and people are inputting all kinds of weird stuff and there's like weird outputs and you start thinking that you're fixing those outputs, are you A, actually fixing those outputs, and B, are you not regressing the stuff that was already working in the first place? These are like, these are really important things. Um, there's some other stuff that doesn't really matter as much, but it still kind of matters around like latency and error rates. Um, I'm labeling them this way because to be frank, they're usually pretty easy to solve in part because users don't expect language models to be instantaneous. And so if it takes like one or two seconds to produce a response, it's usually fine. Uh, these things are getting hugely better over time. Uh, when we released our, our application early last year, um, average response times were like five seconds and now it's down to like 1.5 seconds uh, through like no, no action of our own. Um, cost is also something that like, I mean, in this economy, everybody's worried about cost, but like, let's be real, like most organizations have budget for AI and they're willing to spend it. Uh, and you really don't need the most powerful models to achieve most outcomes that you're looking for. Uh, we've been live in production with GPT 3.5 since May of last year and have had no need to change it. Uh, if we can do it, you probably can too. Um, and hallucinations, like see previous slide. People talk about, oh, I don't want the AI app to hallucinate, but like, it's not about hallucinations. It's, am I feeding the right information to the model, and am I producing the right output based off of that right information that I'm feeding in the first place? And can I actually systematically show that over time? This is just the core of making these apps more reliable. And so like a way that that might look is you can imagine you have a whole bunch of info, like you wanna log like a full prompt that you build up programmatically. Maybe you have a whole bunch of steps that lead up to that. Um, in the, the application that we built last year, there's actually on the order of about 38 distinct operations that happen upstream of a language model call. So like logging all of that stuff 
and tracking that, understanding your latency, like your status code, what your error was, like your usage, if you're doing any post-processing on the JSON, like what post-processing steps you're actually doing. Your diagram kind of looks like this. Um, and uh, it just involves gathering user input, contextual information, request to a service. Sometimes you may do multiple searches. Sometimes you may have to re-rank search results based off of like different techniques that could work better and certain, like, certain inputs may lend themselves better to a different like search um, system. Like these are kind of complicated things. Um, and like you eventually get to the point where you're calling an LLM and you wanna have like, okay, what was the input, what was the output? But like there's this whole system that you're trying to gather information about. And post-processing steps can often be a rather large um, set of things, like um, speaking again from, from production, we have about two dozen or so possible post-processing steps that can occur where a language model gets something mostly right, and that mostly right is actually something that we can deterministically check and either insert or remove data from like the response that we get. Like this is, when you're in production, you're trying to make stuff better for your users, you find out all of this fun stuff where you can make this stuff actually work. Um, so, sounds an awful lot like a tracing problem, right? I got all this stuff happening upstream of this black box. Maybe it involves some other black boxes. Maybe it involves a whole bunch of calls to language models. Maybe it eventually calls a language model. Maybe it calls a language model 20 times. Maybe it calls it five times. Who knows? Who cares? I do something afterwards. Like, there's all these words like services flying around. This is literally just a tracing problem. This is an observability problem. So this is where I talk about open telemetry. Um, and as I said, the OTEL part is like, one of the least interesting parts, but I think that's great because uh, it's actually quite fit for purpose here. Um, what do you want to capture? Well, traces, yay. Uh, you have like an end-to-end -end flow, like a user types in a thing and they like click a button or they hit enter. Like what are all the different things that are actually hit? How do you capture that? Well, you use traces to like tie all of that together. Now it gets a little bit more um, into the weeds about if you wanna capture a whole bunch of information in that trace data, or if you wanna capture like, for example, like a full prompt text or full LLM response, depending on its size, like that may be more fit for a log that you then correlate with the trace. It's kinda up to you, it's kinda up to like, what you use for your tracing backend to analyze this data in the first place. Um, you wanna capture information about post-processing results. Um, and you can also aggregate some metrics around things like latency and cost, your typical error rate, just typical boring stuff you can throw up on a dashboard to sort of say, okay, like I know that generally speaking it's doing all right. Um, there is literally nothing as far as I can tell, and at least in my experience, in open telemetry that prevents you from doing this today. Um, they're, depending on the language you're using, maybe like for example, Go with logs is like not as far along with Java with logs, so if you have a Java app, it's gonna be a lot easier than if you use Go or something, but like fundamentally, all the places are there for you to be able to do this. Um, and so then you get into the fun stuff, like actually analyzing this information. Um, I have found, I, 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 I put it in quotes, I called it the golden triplet, I don't know if it's actually that. Um, inputs, errors, and responses for each request that a user gives. And uh, like if I have an agent or a chain or something, like maybe there's, there's like a correlation ID that I, that I tie to like that particular thing that I'm doing. Or maybe it's represented as multiple traces that are linked together via span links. Um, again, OTEL fit for purpose for this kind of stuff. Um, and I just look at patterns of inputs and outputs. Like in the natural language query feature that we built last year, it was somebody that like, for example, Honeycomb's backend is like strangely complicated to ask what an error rate is if you don't have a metric about that. Um, and people were asking for what's my error rate? And it's like, well, crap, actually that is like weirdly unanswerable in certain ways. So like, what do we even do um, when, when like this is a common thing they wanna do? So like we were failing in like a category, like you can imagine all the different ways that somebody might phrase what is my error rate. Um, doesn't matter how they phrased it, the category of input led to a category of output that just sucked. And so we're like, great, this is like a class of bug that we can now try to solve for. And we can dig into some of those requests, be like, okay, these are all the decisions that we made upstream of the language model call. This is what the language model actually produced. These are the post-processing steps where like we accidentally just removed a bunch of stuff that we shouldn't have removed and there was like a bug in that that was unrelated to the language model. It was just us being dumb. Um, and uh, brought it into development and just said, great, I have like concrete what is actually happening here and I can start then annotating outputs and saying this is what the output was this is what the output should be. And that's called an evaluation if you're in the ML world. And you start building up sets of these evaluations and then you can start systematically actually fixing this stuff and making it better. And it makes these inscrutable black boxes tangible and actionable 
rather than just throw stuff at the wall and hope it sticks. So what's open telemetry doing to help? Well, aside from being mostly fit for purpose, um, there is work going on in the uh, LLM Semantic Conventions Working Group on Slack. Uh, this is where it turns out there's a whole lot of common operations in this kind of application that you're building when you're talking about vector databases, you're talking about calling different language models, whether the language model is like a single shot sort of thing or if it's a part of an agent. Um, like there's names that you can assign to this kind of stuff and names that we are uh, assigning to, like what should live on a span versus like should this be captured in an event that's correlated to a span? And like what should the default be? Should this data be captured or should it be redacted by default and can you turn it on? What does that mechanism look like. Um, and we're working with the uh, open LLMetry folks who have taken a spike at like, let's build a bunch of auto instrumentations for this stuff and see what it actually looks like. And working with them to say, okay, based off of that, this works, this one doesn't work, this one works really well, this one, eh, maybe, I don't know, and see if we can formalize that into a spec. So it's very much underway right now. Um, there are pieces that are like, pretty, like, I don't want to say it's stable, it's like totally experimental, but like you could reasonably build instrumentations off of what's been defined today. Uh, but there's a lot more work to come. And uh, we really, I would really encourage anyone who's interested in this space to uh, uh, engage in this area, um, especially if you're working for any of the tech companies that is involved in building models, because y'all models have like weird ways to capture inputs and outputs, and like we like standards and stuff. So it'd be great if we could figure out the best possible way to represent stuff instead of treating OpenAI as a de facto standard, for example. Um, so this is what's going on. OTEL is like good enough for you to use today. You gotta do a little bit more manual instrumentation, but like chances are uh, with the budget that's being assigned to these applications, you're gonna have the time to do that. Uh, and there's gonna be more auto instrumentations coming. There's good, um, uh, good spec level stuff being defined right now, and I think in the near future you could see this as being as commonplace in OTEL as like database stuff or HTTP stuff, um, and hopefully without too much churn in the spec itself. So that's what I got. Uh, right now, this is all patching from the outside. Um, so, like, I've written like a library for like Python that, that just calls like the open a wraps the OpenAI calls, for example, from the Python SDK. Um, the OpenLMetry project is similar sorts of things. Um, what we are hoping as a part of this that um, like the AI providers in their SDKs just have the OTEL APIs and just you know like. It's just producing like no op spans, for example, so it doesn't impact anyone unless they turn it on. Um, kind of going again with sort of the goal of Otel, where like instrumentation is everywhere, and then it just you can just turn it on and, it, and it's available. So, um, but first, I think like we need to lay some of the groundwork because they're going to have immediately questions like, "Hey, should I like put the prompt in the span, or should I create an event, or like should I even do that? Like, what do I do?" Uh, and that's where like us nailing this down on the spec level side from the open telemetry project standpoint is really going to help them out. Yeah. So so that yeah. For anyone who didn't hear the question, this is so I gave input uh, an example of like user input, possible error, and LM output as something that you could look at. What are some other examples of things? Um, so uh, some some examples that I can tell you by way of um, example from one of Honeycomb's features is so like it's like natural language to querying tool. Um, so you need to query a data set. That data set has a schema. That schema can be massive, and you can't just include literally every single name of everything in the schema inside of every request that you make to the model. So there's this problem of like, okay, what subset do we actually pick? Which one is the most appropriate subset? So um, we have like, uh, like there's, there's text-based search, and there's vector search, and there's like, which one did we pick? Um, which subset from each did we end up picking? What was the actual like, Result that we gave. So, like, you know, I'm, I'm like, you know, you don't, you don't want to capture like the act, if you use vec vector embeddings, you don't want to capture the actual vector embeddings because they're massive and like you're not going to be able to interpret them. But you want to distill that down a little bit. Uh, there's also other contextual things. So, like, for example, in, in our application, um, each request that a user make may be different 
to other requests. So like if you're talking to a different data set, that's a different schema involved. So you want to capture some information about what that what what's actually going on there so you can distinguish between what are my errors for this data set versus what are my errors for this data set and like do we perform better or one or the other and does that tell us like okay is that a problem with our prompting or is that a problem with how we do retrieval across different data sets um, another thing is there's other like specific stuff that you can pull in so a very common prompting technique is called um, like few shot prompting where you sort of embed little examples inside of the prompt that you send as a part of a request uh, you can actually create a database of those examples of like well-known, okay, given some like representation of what retrieval data looks like, a user's input, and what the ideal output for that input should look like based off of that data, you can build up a whole, a whole database of that. You can also do search techniques on which pieces of that you actually pull in on a per request basis. So if you have like 50 few shot examples that are all like generally really good, which three to five are gonna be the most helpful for this specific request? Capture that information. And then like basically what you end up with is you end up with like a really, really big grouping. Like imagine like a big CSV with just tons and tons of columns. And you're like, okay, for each request, here's all the stuff that was interesting about that. And now you get into like, okay, what are the patterns in each of those um, user behaviors? Uh, fun fact, if you are working with an ML engineer, they're gonna want that CSV. Uh, and they're gonna want as many columns in it as possible because that's gonna help their job if they're building like evaluation sets. It's gonna make them more, um, like, I don't know, I've talked with a bunch of ML engineers and they're like, please load that CSV up with as much data as you possibly can. Like, err on the side of too much data because it's probably not even enough. Um, so like, I don't know, that, that, hopefully that's helpful. Um, well, gigabytes per hour, I don't know, it kinda depends on the application. I would say that first, chances are your prompts don't need to be as big as they are and your responses may not necessarily be that big either. Um, but like this I think is not too different from any other observability problem regarding sampling. Like chances are that for some system there's gonna be some like Pareto distribution of like the kinds of inputs that people actually wanna ask about. Like if it's a natural language tool for like Prometheus for example, um, like 80% of the questions that people are gonna ask are gonna follow a pretty similar kind of pattern, and so you could sample that much more aggressively than others, and so there's ways that you could actually detect that. Um, there are other, like, to be frank, like some observability systems are a lot cheaper than others, and like it's a great opportunity to be like, oh wow, maybe my bill's a little too high right now, and um, maybe per gigabyte pricing is not the right pricing scheme for what I'm trying to deal with. Um, I think it kind of depends there, but like I don't think we're really at a point where we're going to be limited by that, unless you're at the like Amazon, Microsoft scale of like, oh, I have a million users who are doing this. Well, I don't know. It's just going to be expensive. Operating at that scale is expensive. Um, I think today, yes, there's like there's certainly some active research being done around like true debuggability into these things, but like I, I think some of that could also just end up being like incomprehensible where. Like a model like GBD 3.5 even is just, there's so many like activations of different layers that are going on that like it, that may not even be helpful um, or it may just be too hard to sort of wrangle around. Now I know that there are certain um, things that you can do like you can, um, you can ask it to generate multiple responses and you have a system that picks which response you want. And there's these, there's these things that are called log probabilities that assign like, okay, the, the probability of like this token, like this, and, and it'll basically say like, here's like a set of tokens that we were going to generate. And these were the probabilities that were assigned to them. And that's why this one was, was, was chosen. Now it doesn't tell you the actual decision-making process that led into that, but that can inch you a little bit closer to that. Um, to be honest, I've not really run into anyone who's like really used that stuff a whole lot. Uh, like I know that it exists, but like it's um, you're you're getting pretty sophisticated and you're debugging it at that point. And I would say that most people are just not at that point yet, um, if ever. Um, I think like also it's like regular observability of systems is like, well, sometimes we're working with stuff that are black boxes that kind of suck um, sometimes and do weird stuff in production that you can never reproduce locally. Uh, and then you are still, still in this place of like, okay, like what patterns are leading to these outputs and what can I do with that info? Um, and uh, I think we're there right now. Um, we might get somewhere in the future where you could more like fine tune debug something, but um, probably not for a while.